gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of the Paul Brown Show. We're shooting live at Two Expose You Studio. We have Mr. Daryl Goodman, he's the founder, Mr. Ray Harvey, Chief Engineer. This evening, I have as my special guest, Mr. Maxwell Melvin, Lifers Group. How you doing there, Mr. Melvin? I'm doing all right, sir, and yourself? I'm doing great this morning. How about you? I'm doing great. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, yes, I will. My name is uh, Maxwell Melvin. Uh, I'm uh, six years old. I'm a person who uh, has been in and out of the criminal justice system. Uh, uh, I was sent to uh, 25 years like since I'm in prison. While in prison, you know, I, uh, all this couldn't be in vain. I was in prison as a result of the death of my best friend. And uh, while in prison, I said that, you know, I needed to do something, you know, to get back to my community. And in honor of my friend, I needed to do something not to try to, to compensate, you know, for the loss of his life, but in honor of my friend. So while in there, I was working with the Lifers Group, and um, I, I saw in 1990, around that time frame, uh, there was a lot with uh, our kids in, in the music industry, and that uh, the people in the music industry and rap music was coming out, were sending our kids the wrong message out there. So I reached out to some people and um, I wanted to send a message out to our kids. And I said, if they're listening to what the rappers are as far as the clothing that they're wearing, the hairstyles, maybe that we could get our message out there in that same manner and that they would listen to us and it would help to end the uh, prison uh, um, to, um, to pipeline to prison. And so... We recorded uh, an EP, and um, as a result of that EP, uh, you know, our message was getting across in the way that we knew it was getting across because we had a lot of great responses from parents and things that said their kids had, you know, started to, you know, try to do something with their lives, and they were very much interested in our music and our message and what we had to say. And... For some reason, uh, our music and our message ended up out there in uh, Hollywood, and um, they wanted, you know, we end up being nominated for a Grammy for this uh, uh, EP against Peter Gabriel, Sinead O'Connor, Billy Joel, and however, we did not win the Grammy, and uh, my intentions weren't for a Grammy or anything, but our message did get out there and reach, you know, the public. You know, so it did afford us that, you know, and I thought that we had won something much greater than a Grammy because a Grammy is only something that would have set on a shelf somewhere. So, you know, what we walked away with was much greater than that. As I said, we walked away with knowing that we were helped to turn some of those children's lives around. The topic is criminal justice. Okay, you were the youngest of 15 siblings in Camden, New Jersey. S describe your growing up in that area. <laughs> well, growing up in that area was, uh, as you know, most, most urban uh, cities, uh, you know, growing up around 15 uh, brothers and sisters, you know, my brothers and sisters, most of them were pretty much into other things. Uh, however, I was one who uh, gravitated more towards the streets. I lived not far from Rutgers uh, State College in Camden, New Jersey. And uh, I lived on this side of the Ben Franklin Bridge, which takes you to Philadelphia, and Rutgers University was on the other side of the bridge. And um, I liked the things that I saw on the other side of the bridge, which was tennis court, swimming pools, and different things at Rutgers State University. And, you know, it's just strange that Rutgers, however, led, was, led me to my first incarceration because I enjoyed going over there and seeing the beauty of the green grass and everything because the security guard, uh, you know, ran me away from there a couple of times. However, one day I had my dog with me, and uh, he said, didn't I tell you don't come over here no more? 
and you know and, and my response was didn't i tell you to leave me alone so i like kind of like put my dog on him my dog chased him uh that particular day uh he didn't get me and at that time they didn't carry guns and the following week he uh caught me and apprehended me and he took me to juvenile detention that was my first brush with the law you know as a result of me wanting to go over and visit Rutgers state university you know uh camden new jersey during that time was it was uh, infested with drugs it was uh, infested with criminal activities and everything i wanted to be grown at uh at a, at, a, at a different time when i was only actually 14 years old i thought i was a grown man no yes how would you consider your parents as far as raising you and your siblings well, at that time well i would say that uh i believe that my parents did everything that they can do as parents and that it didn't have so much to do with them. It had as much to do with me. Uh, I was more so influenced by the streets and of, of, of Camden, New Jersey and the activities that were going on on the streets and not the activities that were going on at home. And, uh, you know, like my parents, you know, did their best with me. And, you know, you can't, you can't blame it on the parents. And in this day and time, a lot of people, I hear them uh, blame it on the parents well. The child is like this because of their parents or they didn't raise them right. No, because there are people that do everything to raise their children and that parents, there's no guarantee of how you're going to turn out, you know, but they did everything that they can do as parents. You know, it was on me. Okay, this, so, uh, describe life in prison to our youth who feels like committing a crime is a sign of achievement in today's society. Well, wow. Um, yeah, in today's society, yes. But, uh, you know, a lot of people wear it as a, a badge of honor. And, uh, you know, like, you know, this is the only way anyone's going to respect you or whatever. It's, it's if you've been to prison or somewhere. And that is kind of like the concept in which most of our youth today take, you know, and believe that nobody, you know, you're nobody, you know, just like, just like, you know, you, you're just nobody, you know, but that's not true, you know, um, but they believe that, you know, and like I said, many of them wear that as a badge of honor, and there's actually no truth to that, and myself at the time, I never even thought about something in, in, in that way. Well, you know, I'm nobody until I go to prison or do something or anything. Like I say, my situation, you know, it just turned out it was more of a misadventure for me, uh, of me, uh, you know, and, and what happened uh, to my best friend, you know, it was, it was more so that it had nothing to do with, well, you know, I'm out here in the streets and, you know, you know, unless I go in there, I ain't going to be nobody. No. Describe that feeling when you got, when you committed that ultimate crime of murder, especially committing that to one of your friends, someone you knew. Well, I hope I can describe it. I'm going to describe it as best as I can. Um, you know, that particular day, uh, you know, like, number one, when a person goes out sometimes and there's a murder or something or shooting anything, you have no idea that that's going to happen. You know, I didn't get up that day and say, I'm going to go out today and I'm going to kill someone or anything. I had no intention of doing anything like that. What actually happened was that, uh, you know, I was using drugs. I started using uh, drugs at the age of 14, actually, which was heroin. And uh, another friend that was with me, um, we wanted some. And, and there was a particular person that sold drugs and sold that, but we were so young, that particular person wouldn't sell them to us. So we sent somebody else. And what happened was the guy finagled me out of uh, $90 worth of drugs. And, uh, you know, and when he, he turned, he said, I don't have the money, you know, the drugs, you know, that someone beat him out of it, meaning they, someone took it, you know. And uh, I didn't believe it number one and so I went back to where we sent them to purchase it and I asked the gentleman there had he sold this gentleman some and he said yes but and, and you know 
right during that time, as I, I returned and was asking this guy that, I ran into my friend, the very friend that had lost his life, and uh, we greeted each other because I hadn't saw him in about three years. And while talking to this friend, uh, you know, you know, we, we hugged each other and everything. I saw the guy that had purchased, you know, supposedly had, uh, you know, we sent the purchase drugs for me. And uh, while talking to him, uh, a group of people yelled out, uh, Maxwell, the car, because I was driving the car at the time. The car had jumped out of gear some way. So I ran over to the car to put it in park. And when putting the car in park, I noticed the guy pulling up in the truck and I had spoken with the guy and he said yes he had sold him the drugs one of my other friends there was a gun on this on the floor of the car so I was very angry and everything and uh, when I saw I grabbed the gun off of the car floor and uh, I ran over to him I believe I hit him with the slap him across the face or something with the pistol and I said I want my money on my drugs he said I don't have either of them. and when he said that you know he took off and he started running so again as i said i was very enraged at that time i grabbed it and i fired four sh uh four reckless shots and one of those uh straight bullets crossed and, and hit an innocent bystander who was, happened to be my very best friend the gentleman that i had just spoken with moments before and uh, you know this gentleman he had you know no brush with the law never been in any type of trouble he used to work down at the actually the community center and helping the kids showing them how to box showing them how to swim and all these things i didn't know anyone had got hit by a bullet until a gentleman walked over to me and say why did you hit that guy why did you shoot that guy i said shoot what guy i, I said well i didn't i didn't mean to shoot anyone so the crowd started to come towards me and, you know, me, you know, in fear and everything, I just took off and knowing what I had just done and knowing what I had just done, you know, you know, it was just like, I don't know what to do. So again, I just took off and I left and I went on a run for a couple of days and I went to New York City. While in New York City, I learned the identity of that person and I also you know, learned that that person was on life support and everything. And, you know, I learned the identity of that person. And, and, you know, when they gave me the person's name and, you know, I, I discovered it was my best friend. Uh, I decided that I wanted to turn myself in. Miss Plachette, P2, Cassier. Okay, I'm Miss Plachette. I know now, I know we've talked about another topic, voting and the importance of voting. Now, what's your views on voting in our community? Well, again, I'll just say we need to take each other to vote. We need to use every means that's out there from absentee. First of all, again, we want to make sure we register. If you will be 18 this year, make sure you register to vote and more important than registering is actually vote remember you have to register let's make our deadline set by september 30th okay um 30 days before time to vote is the, is the cutoff date to be able to vote in november 3rd that's election day so everybody Take somebody with you or absentee, you can go ahead and um Okay, what are some uh, possible yeah. changes that they will be having when it comes to voting for people who you know will there be any changes that they need like IDs or anything like that that we should be aware of? Yes. So if you you're South Carolina, well I'll, I'll talk about South Carolina. You can take your South Carolina ID. Now, from my understanding, the real ID, they're postponing that. Um, so they, you know, again, they don't want us out in public in droves. And um, I understand that they're like 60 days behind with everything at the police department. So your driver's license, your student ID, if it's an official one, but 100% sure that your driver's license is an ID that you can use to vote. And um, 
you don't necessarily have to have your um, voter's registration card. As long as you have your driver's license, you can vote. And um, again, they want you to consider doing early voting or absentee voting. Because again, we don't know what Corona will be doing by November. So those are the options. And if you're 18 this year, up until December 31st, you can register to vote. If you will be 18 any day this year. So what advice would you give to the older generation when it comes to them voting and how we need them to get out there and vote as well? Exactly. So I strongly challenge family members of our uh, older population that should be in the house quarantined uh, because they're at risk for Corona, that's our priority, them not getting sick so that they can be here and you not getting sick while you're protesting so you can be here to vote. All the more reason for everybody to consider early voting. And that's you. that takes you making a phone call to the um, voter registration um, office. It's on Dorchester Road for um, Charleston County, and um, you, I wish I should have had the number with me. My apologies, but if you go to um, voter registration office, if you Google that, there's a telephone number that um, will come up. You make the phone call. You have to call for it, and I understand you can also apply for it online and get your um, absentee vote ballot, and um, you can vote that way. Just remember, you can't do both. And those of you that choose to do the absentee ballot, please remember to mail the ballot in. I'm always upset when I go to a person's house and they didn't mail their ballot in. I'm also heartfelt when an older person, um, they just said no one ever came and got their ballot. You know, so they they really think someone is going to come and get it. So they're again our families have to be accountable and keep our seniors in mind those that are at home i even say to churches you know you you go around and you give them communion so let's um find out why you're giving them communion um whether they received their absentee ballot and if they did did someone mail it for them so um let's Let's not leave any leaf unturned. Anna Evans. She's the founder of Evans Counseling and Consulting, LLC. How are you doing there, Miss Evans? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for coming on the show. Tell the audience a little bit about Tiana Evans. So um, I was born and raised in Carolina, specifically Spromberg, where I went to University of South Carolina for my undergrad and graduate education. Upon completing the program, I temporarily moved to Charlotte. And the interesting thing is that I said, that's where I was going to live. That's where I was going to stay. You know, I was going to live my best life there. And then somehow I found my way back home to South Carolina. So um, I've been back now for approximately six years, and it's been nothing but good to me and my family. Evans Counseling and Consulting. Tell us a little bit about your counseling service, ma'am. Yes, so Evans Counseling and Consulting is a multi-specialty practice where we offer services for their post-accident and personal injury clients. We also offer stress management, which is especially important right now during during COVID-19. And we offer premarital counseling. It's pretty key and important in those who are pursuing marriage. What made you want to start your business? Well, I definitely identified that there was a need here in Columbia, South Carolina, um, which is where my practice is located in downtown area. 
um, for those who needed services, um, it is hard to be able to connect with other mental health providers due to them being overwhelmed already by their own caseloads or limited access. So I definitely wanted to be able to provide more access to community resources by opening my own practice and helping those who are seeking help. Now I know I talked to some of my audience prior to the show and they want to ask some questions about some of your areas. One of the areas is your premarital counseling. One of the questions that they ask is, once the date has been set as far as the marriage, when should someone or the couple start seeking counseling? Um, I believe the sooner the better, um, because there is quite a lot of processing to do because when you think about it, it's two completely different individuals coming together to merge as one. People with different backgrounds, people with family, different family history, expectations. So it can be quite overwhelming to merge together. It does take some adjustments. So I definitely would recommend that those who um, are engaged in seeking marriage definitely start as soon as possible. Another question someone had as far as premarital counseling is, do you suggest HIV testing by each member prior or should they do it together or what's your suggestion on that? That is a very good question. So I definitely don't think it's a bad thing to go ahead and have some type of medical screening just to make sure that both parties are in superb health. Um, the worst that could happen is that the test results don't come back positive or when they do come back positive and then there has to be some difficult situations and conversations that have to occur. But I definitely think that it's good um, and it further in, um, validates the trust that you all have for one another. If there is one of the members of the couple, if there's some type of resentment as far as wanting to consent this testing, do you think there may be some type of issue as far as one trust in the other? I believe that if there is some pushback um, regarding the other partner not wanting to test, um, it's important to kind of process that together. It's important to explore what is their reservations or hesitations, and then once that has been determined, um, working through that and following through with it. Because I'm sure there's something as to why they don't feel it as necessary. And in order to be able to move past it, it does need to be addressed. Another big thing that, a question that one of my people, one of my guests had was as far as the finance. Why is that such a big issue in marriages these days? Yes, finance is among the top two reasons that divorce happens. When you're merging finances, that's very, very tricky and delicate um, discussion to to address. Um, people are very people are very possessive. You know, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours. Honestly, whatever works for the couple is what should happen. So I'm not saying that you have to merge accounts, but you have to do what's in the best interest of both parties. If both parties agree to a joint account, great. If both parties agree to separate accounts, that's fine as well. And if both parties agree that there's an account just for the bills that they share and then they have their own separate accounts, that's great as well. As long as it works for both parties, both parties are in agreement. But finances is a very delicate and sticky situation and that's definitely something that's addressed in premarital counseling. Who do you feel should handle the, the financial aspect of it? Because mm -hmm. both persons that, really can't handle that part of it. Right. Well, that is not for me to determine. So what happens is that 
excuse me what happens is that there's a discussion that is held in session between the both of them as well as the counselor we discuss people's strengths and weaknesses and generally whoever is more organized um, whoever has a better better understanding of cash flow that is the individual that usually steps up and says you know i'll take responsibility for the finances and making sure everything is paid everything is balance but i do not make that decision for them that right. is something that i help them to come to an agreement on what if there's a resentment from the other person as far as you know you don't trust me as far as handling the finance because remember they have been handling the finances being single and they kind of like feel like it's a resentment that you don't trust me if we're together as a couple. Well, it's not really a matter of trust. It's a matter of who is more comfortable and who can perform and manage it better. Trust is, is it goes both ways. It's, I have to trust you to be able to manage this money that is ours now, because it's not just yours, it's not just mine, it's ours now. And it's trust that I am going to step back and say, you know what, you are responsible for this, so I'm not going to constantly hound you or go behind you or double check behind you to make sure that this is happening. I trust you as my husband or I trust you as my wife to make sure that business is handled regardless. So it does require trust on both ends. It's not just one trusting the other. Now I know credit score is a big thing these days. Should we look at each other when it comes to that credit score and should that be a, a factor as far as them getting married? Credit score is something important to look a little further into because um, it just gives you a, a good ideal of where you all stand together um, and where there is room for some growth. And coming up with a calculated business plan on how you tend to improve if the one of the partners have a lower credit score than the other or you know who is going to put whatever big purchase in their name um, so it is important to look at that aspect the credit score and then work together with it now do i believe that it should be a determining factor on if you should move forward with that partner or not i don't agree with that because a credit score isn't something that's permanent it can be worked upon and if both parties are willing to give each other time and the patience and learn how to improve, then I don't think that should be a determining factor.